Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Utah Student Association and all 162,000 members of the Utah Student Association, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this 2010 gubernatorial debate. My name is Cooper Henderson. I am the student body president at Westminster College and also the legislative vice president for the State Student Association. On behalf of all the student body presidents in the state, I would like to sincerely thank both gubernatorial candidates for being here this afternoon. It's uh, really a gesture of good faith that they'll come discuss the issues at an event that was organized by college students, specifically for college students. This is really the exclamation point on our voter registration drive we've conducted over the last month at every college and university in the state of Utah. I am honestly of the mind that without an informative event like this, our voter registration wouldn't mean anything. So with that being said, I'd like to thank all eight schools that have representatives here this afternoon. I know many of you drove a long distance to be here. Don't think that we don't notice the sacrifice you've made. We look forward to an informative debate between the two candidates. And now I would like to introduce the Executive Director of the Utah Student Association and a dear friend of mine, Mr. Joseph Watkins. This mic. We have two awards for students, two, two of the schools in the state that have performed uh, voter registration drives here in Utah. The students across the state have been working hard over the last few months to register students to vote here in the state of Utah. The Utah Student Association is very conscientious of the efforts that, uh, that these campuses have made and we'd like to recognize them. We thank them for their hard work and for getting out and helping the students on their campus be civically engaged. There's two categories. Because all schools are not the same size, we have a per capita winner and an overall winner. The per capita winner this year for the 2010 uh, College Bowl voter registration drive is Weber State University. Come on up, Victoria. Victoria and her students uh, were, were able to register, what was it, 16, 1,600? 1,670 students on their campus. Let's give them a round of applause for that. This year, the overall winner for the 2010 College Bowl Voter Registration Drive is Utah Valley University. Utah Valley University registered over 2,300 students to vote this year. We're very proud of them. Come back up here, you guys. Uh, we, have, we have a little special gift for them that uh, they're going to share over the year. It's, it's the, the actual college bowl. Hold on one second. This is a surprise. Hoist, hoist that up. Yeah, you got to share. You got to share. We would have got the Stanley Cup, but the students don't have that much money. We'd like to congratulate them one more time for their, for their efforts. We're now going to have Chase Jardine, the student body president at the University of Utah and the executive vice president of the Utah Student Association, come up and introduce our moderator. It's, uh, it's my privilege to introduce our moderator for the debate today. Today's moderator is Richard Pyatt. Uh, Richard, if you want to come up. Richard is from... Oh. <laughs> Rich is from KSL TV News, and he joined the team, the Eyewitness News team, on April 15th, 1998. Over his 20 years in TV news, he has won a number of awards for his wonderful work and was nominated for two regional Emmy Awards. He has covered state capitals in Michigan, Indiana, Idaho, and Utah. He's covered four presidents, interviewed Vice President Dan Quell, and did an exclusive interview with Barbara Bush. On his downtime, Rich loves everything Utah has to offer, skiing in the winter, 
hiking and biking in the summer. So it's our privilege to have Rich here with us. Give him a hand. Thanks, Davis. Thank you. Good job. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me here. It's, an, it's really quite an honor to be asked to moderate this debate, one of just a handful, really, of debates that are very important in the process of the state selecting the next governor. And uh, having covered both Governor Herbert and Mayor Peter Caroon for a number of years, I have to say that uh, both are excellent candidates, excellent men, both highly qualified to do the jobs that they're doing. Both have very, very difficult jobs, and I think that uh, as you hear them talk about the issues, if you listen very carefully to what they're saying, you'll understand that they take their jobs very seriously, too, as they do the future of, of the state. We did a coin toss just, uh, just a little bit ago, and I'd like to waste no more time and get right to the meat of this, uh, the purpose of why we're here. I'd like to introduce first Governor Gary Herbert, who will be starting our opening statements, followed by Mayor Peter Kroon, then questions from me, the moderator, and then questions from our student body presidents from across the state. So without further ado, Governor Gary Herbert and Mayor Peter Kroon. If I could interrupt just for uh, just for a moment, and uh, and while I have the candidates up there and I'm able to face them, go over the ground rules of of the debate. There's nothing that you're uh, either of you are going to uh, that you haven't heard before. Um, it'll be uh, the moderator, my job to enforce the following rules. Please, no speaking directly or questioning uh, your opponent unless given permission by the moderator. No interrupting or speaking out of turn. Uh, the candidates will provi be provided paper for notes. Do you have paper, gentlemen? I do. All right. The candidates must refer to their opponent's stance as either the governor's or the mayor's. And please, to the audience, no applause except for prior to the start of the event and at the conclusion of the debate at large. Without further ado, let's start with Governor Herbert. Well, thank you, Rich. It's an honor and a privilege for me to be with you here today at UVU. Um, I have uh, a, a, an association with this university which is long and uh, storied. I have children that went to school here, graduated here. I worked on the foundation board uh, to help raise money for this school. Uh, I served as a county commissioner and lobbied for the four-year degrees, the first four-year degrees we had here at this institution. I'm proud to be a part of that when I was lieutenant governor to, to create this into a university that's contributing so much to this community and to the state of Utah. And so I applaud all the efforts and, and you folks of being here, particularly you students. Uh, I've learned as Lieutenant Governor that unfortunately the poorest demographic of those who do not vote, who do not participate in the election process is the 18 to 25 year olds. So I appreciate the efforts of the schools and registration, getting people involved and, and, and out and hopefully that'll increase our voter turnout here in this state and it should. Let me just mention, uh, again, most of you know I took over as governor here uh, August 11th of 2009 in a very difficult time, uh, a challenging time when we were in what we call now the Great Recession. We lost significant revenues in our state at that particular time. My challenge was to balance the budget, protect uh, government services, and particularly education, and see if we could find some way to kickstart the economy and start uh, growing jobs again in this, in this great state. The good news for all of us is, in fact, that happened. We did balance the budget. We did protect services. We held the funding uh, on, for public and higher education. And uh, the good news is, since I've been on, in office, we've grown uh, economic development by 19,000 jobs. 19,000 people are in work uh, today that weren't uh, when I took office. So it's important that we concentrate, we work together on educational opportunities. Again, long-term sustained economic growth really comes with education. We're growing the economy, and that's why we pay the bills, and that's how we'll, uh, we'll move forward uh, for a better economy in Utah, better education, better opportunities for you as, as young people. Thank you. Mayor Groove, you also have two minutes. Thank you. thank you, Rich, and it's great to be here at UVU. I wore my green tie for you. Uh, President Holland, thank you for, for having us here. And again, I, I echo what uh, Governor Herbert said. Uh, it's great to see students involved in our education system. It is a critical time right now for the state of Utah. We have uh, a beautiful state, 
We live in a great state, but in 2010, we have some serious issues that frankly I think some of our state leaders and our current administration is out of touch with. We have the 12th worst budget gap of any state in the nation, and one-time money and, and government, federal government money was used to fill that gap. We have the highest unemployment rate we've had in 26 years, and it continues to rise. We have the fifth highest bankruptcy rate of any state in the nation, and 30% more foreclosures in the first six months of this year compared to last year. And our per people funding, once again, is the lowest in the nation, with the next state, Idaho, being 20% higher than uh, the state of Utah. Things can be so much better. We have great businesses in the state, we have great people in the state, but we need the kind of leadership that will move the state forward. A leadership that will focus on what's important, the basics. Focus on our jobs, on our economy, focus on our education system, and focus on our quality of life as we continue to grow as a state. I've been the executive of the second largest government in the state of Utah, that's Salt Lake County. I'm a fiscal conservative. My budget is lower now overall than it was in 2005 when I have got into office. The state budget has gone up about 26 percent during the same time period. I am also an engineer. Do you have any engineers in the room? No? Well, we're, sometimes we are known as nerds, uh, uh, but uh, we are not. Uh, we are people, though, who have learned to think critically, uh, think as problem solvers, and that is what I have tried to do as Salt Lake County Mayor over the last six years. I'm also a family man. My wonderful wife, Amy, is here with me today. We have three young children, seven, eight, and nine years old. As the executive of the second largest government in Utah, I brought fiscally responsible, honest, ethical government uh, to our uh, county. I want to do the same as governor for the citizens of Utah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Caroon and Governor Herbert. The way this is going to go now is I will ask two questions. You'll each have a minute each to respond and then to respond to the, your opponent. And then following that, uh, those two questions will have a series of questions that will be the same kind of format. You will get uh, 30 seconds for the question and one minute to respond. So in opening, I would like, like to point out that uh, this campaign has gotten, uh, has gotten heated. One of the most heated issues is over that project that is just a few yards away from us, in fact, right now, the I-15 core project and what happened with the bidding situation there. Uh, one, of the, one of the perhaps most disturbing issues regarding that project to taxpayers is the $13 million that was paid to the, to the losing bidder. I think that would be disturbing to students here at UVU who are facing tuition increases and expensive books every time they turn around and, and costs going up and up and up. My question to you, Governor, is that even though there was nothing technically illegal going on uh, during, the, during the course of this, is this, in fact, an indictment of the downside of business as usual in this state? Do voters deserve better? Is there more beneath the surface? Can you, assure, can you assure the voters that this kind of thing will be ferreted out and cleaned up if your administration is allowed to continue? Well, first off, uh, there's probably nothing to clean up. Uh, that's a, a statement that I think is uh, pejorative in its outset. Uh, the explanation that's been given by UDOT and John Nord, I think, is uh, one that anybody who has an interest in finding and following what happened on the bid process will find was according to the law and the appropriate bid was given. Uh, that's something I invite anybody, and, and the UDOT's more than happy to, uh, to do that. They've invited Mr. Karun to come and do that, and, and he's refused. But that's certainly something that anybody could look at. The concern that it seems to be is that there was a settlement given of $13 million. That was something I think was wrong from the standpoint of communication. I didn't know about it. The legislature didn't know about it. There is, in fact, policy in place on other issues, not this one, uh, where there's communication and authorization has to come from the legislature. UDOT did what they were supposed to do as they are authorized according to the law. The lack of communication was, was a problem. That being said, they did not want to get into the Legacy Parkway issue where delay, delay, delay would cost, as it did in the Legacy Parkway, an additional $220 million in taxpayers' costs. So the $13 million ended up being a bargain in, in, in the settlement of this issue in behalf of the taxpayers. And lastly, the transportation fund, part of our budget fund, is way different than the education fund. They are not the same. And so the fact that they spent $13 million in the settlement in no way 
jeopardizes public education or higher education. Business as usual. Uh, I think the system is corrupt and needs to be changed. But we shouldn't have a system where a, a contractor can come into the governor's office, uh, request and have a meeting while they're in, in the middle of uh, trying to get a government contract, uh, give a big donation, and then receive a contract. That system doesn't work. In Salt Lake County, when I got into office, I, I changed the system. We didn't have any rules in place. We prevented uh, donations for more than, more than $10,000. We had caps. Uh, we also prohibited contractors uh, from giving more than $100 to a, to a candidate. That's how we changed the system. That's how we stop what's going on. Even if there's nothing illegal, uh, it certainly is a system that's broken and needs to be changed. As for the $13 million, I wouldn't call that a bargain. Uh, how, many, how many other good causes could that money be going to? Uh, you know, it may not go right into education, but it's the equivalent of you know, 150 or more special education teachers. So that money should have been uh, better used. The governor should have, should have known that that money uh, was being spent on a contractor who didn't get the bid, and I think the system just needs to be changed. It isn't working, and as governor, I would make sure I knew what was going on and work to change the system. All right, well, let me follow up uh, Mayor Karun by just kind of following that train of thought. It is, in fact, easy for you to criticize the governor for not knowing for the way that the bid was handled, but the reality is that UDOT's a huge agency. Utah is a big state, has a huge state government. There are a lot of things that go that go on that the governor may honestly not necessarily know about. So what makes you think that you would have done anything different had you been in office the same length of time that Governor Herbert was in office? And how would you have handled it differently given the fact that the governor has been, has been active in calling for an audit and taking a close look at what really went on? What would be, really be different under your administration? Uh, what would be different? I would, I would have department heads who would trust uh, uh, me enough to give me the information uh, I can't believe that a department head would not inform the governor of a $13 million settlement uh, to, uh, that was going on to a contractor who didn't uh, do any work for the state. Uh, I would not uh, put up with uh, any, anybody in my administration who would do that, frankly. And also, I think it's uh, critical to have uh, rules and regulations in place. I know uh, Gary Herbert's now talking about changing that. Uh, any settlement above a certain amount of money, whether it's $100,000 or $10,000, uh, should go directly to the governor's office so that the governor is informed about what was going on. All right. Governor, are you upset that you, John Nord, the head of UDOT, didn't let you know what was going on with that bid? Yeah, I'm upset that we didn't have good communication, but he didn't do anything wrong. He was authorized to do that by state statute by the legislature. So it's hard to fault that aspect of it. It's probably just common sense that we ought to be kept in the loop for communication purposes, and, and I think the legislature feels that way, and we will probably make a change this upcoming legislative session. We are doing an audit to make sure that uh, you don't need to take my word for it, that everything was uh, on the up and up. Uh, but uh, we're going to do an independent audit to, to make sure that the public at large feels comfortable with what's been uh, done and, and what's taken place. Um, John Nord, who is the director of UDOT, is well recognized nationally as one of the best transportation directors in the nation. So uh, again, he's invited anybody who has an interest about the process to come and look at it. Again, I've, they've invited uh, Mayor Corinne a number of times to, sh to ease his fears and alleviate his concerns that maybe there's something wrong. Again, he's refused to do that. The Federal Highway Administration has said this is uh, on the up and up. They've given a clean bill of health, as has the Deputy Attorney General that was in there every bit uh, the process. 600 independent UDOT workers were part of the bid process. So we got the right outcome. The communication was not good, and that's going to change. All right. Let me give Mayor Karun an opportunity to respond to that, and I'll give you 30 seconds each. Uh, and then first of all, I have, I have seen, seen the facts about, uh, about the $13 million payoff. Uh, but the, the real issue is, is, uh, is not about me and what I know, it's about the citizens and making sure the citizens are comfortable that their government is not being influenced by big money. And that's again why I think we need campaign finance reform. Regarding the audit as well, it's my understanding the audit is not about the $13 million, but is about uh, uh, UDOT and how its uh, functions take place. So uh, I think it's, it's being a little bit misrepresented about what that audit is actually doing. 
Well, that's not true. The audit is all-encompassing to look at every aspect of it, to see if anything in process was handled right or wrong. Was there any kind of uh, undue influence? Was there anything that was untoward in the process? So I expect a full and comprehensive vetting of the issue, and uh, again, the public will understand that. Uh, again, I think it's uh, one thing to look at the documents on a web page. It's another thing to let the director explain in person after the uh, accusation has been made to say, uh, Mayor Caroon, take a look at the process. See if there's any way that anybody could have had influence, if the governor could have had influence. Uh, I think um, it would be a nice gesture, Mayor, to, to go there and take advantage of that opportunity. All right. Well, let's go ahead and switch gears because I know we have a lot of students who are chomping at the bit to ask some questions themselves. Let's start with uh, Rachel Ryan from USU CEU who has a question. Good afternoon, gentlemen. <laughs> what are your plans to support the educational aspirations of students living in the rural areas of Utah, such as Price and Moab? Mayor Karun. First of all, I think every student uh, deserves a good education, and every student who wants to get a college education uh, should be able to do so. Uh, over the last, uh, over the last uh, couple of years, hundreds of millions of dollars have been taken out of our education budget. Uh, this year, again, Governor Herbert uh, c cut the education budget while we have 24,000 new students coming into our education system. So I think it is critical, not only for our young people, but for our economy as well, that we have good, uh, strong education systems, not only in the urban areas, but in the rural areas as well. I think there's, uh, there's things we can do. I think we can use better technology as well. So a student in uh, Kane County or a student in uh, Salt Lake or a student in, in Weber County can all take a, uh, an online course with an advanced placement course, for example, and that way you can uh, use technology to, to reduce costs but have everybody getting the same good, good quality education. I think that's one of the things we can do. And then just make sure that every, uh, every school is being treated equally throughout the state of Utah. Governor? Well, thank you. It's an important question, and uh, we are doing significant uh, uh, measures in trying to expand educational opportunity throughout the state. Uh, we are, in fact, using technology to, have, in fact, virtual classrooms where you can teach in one spot but and interface with five or six or seven different locations. Utah State University is doing some wonderful things for rural remote uh, educational opportunities. On my watch, we have, in fact, have increased education funding two to one over student growth. So public education has, has increased twice as fast funding as the student population. We've increased significantly the funding for teachers. We've given the largest, in fact, infusion into public education in our state's history on my watch. Uh, we, we plan to do that by bringing people together as we continually work together with my Education Excellence Commission, which is bringing diverse points of view and people together to handle uh, unique challenges that we find here in Utah. High birth rate, large families, and a lot of public land. The way you fund education, though, is you grow the economy. You don't raise the taxes, you grow the economy and expand the opportunity. That's why in Utah, as Peter's talked about, our, our, our budget's grown. Most of that money and the growth has gone into education because we've grown the economy and been able to fund education at levels we haven't had in the past. All right. I, I think it's the chicken and the egg. Uh, we have to have a good education in, terms, uh, in, in order to have a good, strong economy. Uh, we can't just re rely uh, on uh, economic growth t to fund our education system. Obviously, that's very important, uh, but in order to have a strong economy for the future, we need to make sure we're uh, focusing on and funding our education system in good times and in, in bad. I, I wouldn't argue with that. I, I believe they are joined at the hemp. My three priorities have been economic development, grow the economy, create jobs, education, which gives us long-term sustained economic opportunity, and energy, particularly for rural Utah. Uh, I was in Garfield County not too long ago asking the high school seniors and juniors there, how many of you are going to go on to higher education? Every one of them raised their hand. How many of you are going to come back to Panguitch in Garfield County to find a job when you're out of college? Only one hand remained, that was a, 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 a farmer a son of a rancher that was going to come back to the family farm. It's not just education, it's a combination of economic opportunity and empowering the private sector and education that stimulates ongoing economic growth which in turn funds education. All right, well obviously we've hit on something that voters get to sort out which candidate they prefer on. Let's go to our next question from Viu Vakapuna from Salt Lake Community College. Thank you. 
Question. The formula in which the government seems to use every year during the legislative session is to increase tuition in order to fund higher education. This threatens Salt Lake Community College's mission statement as an open enrollment institution. What is your administration willing to do? Well, again, I, I, I understand the challenge. I have children that have been in college and university and, and the, the tuition, Dad, hey, can you fix the tuition? Uh, we understand that challenge as tuition costs go up. Uh, our first and primary focus has got to be on public education because by constitution we have to fund that. We don't have the constitutional obligation on higher education. But again, as I've mentioned, I'll reiterate it, how you fund education is by growing the economy, creating more income tax, which is then earmarked to go into the education fund. We've done a great job now of empowering private donations. In fact, it's something we're probably looking at to help with our public education funding. Most universities don't live on just the tax dollar. They live on tuition and private donations and foundations. I worked on the foundation here to raise private money to help offset the cost of uh, education, provide additional scholarships for students to give everybody an opportunity. So it's a collaborative effort. There's no silver bullet out there. Uh, it is the great recession we're coming out of, and costs, in fact, have been rising. But we're doing a pretty good job of keeping tuition in Utah at the lower one-third of the national level. In, in, in fact, tuition's gone up fairly significantly, and our education budget for higher education was cut, I think, about 17 percent. Uh, we shouldn't put the burden of balancing the budget on the backs of our students. Uh, we shouldn't burden our young people uh, any more than they have to be burdened uh, to get a college education. Uh, we, should, we, uh, we have a plan, and I have an education plan. It's online, votecaroon.com, which talks about some possible solutions. One solution is uh, freezing tuition for students when they come into the education uh, system, uh, where they can then plan for their future for the next two or four years. I think that would be one way, one way we could uh, help our students plan for their future and know what their college tuition costs would be as they go through the system. All right, very good. Let's move on to Richard Portwood, who has a question. He's from Utah Valley University here. Thank you. Gentlemen, here at Utah Valley University, we have the least amount of square feet per student, and we also receive the least amount of funding per student of all schools in the Utah system of higher education. What will you do as governor to ensure equitable funding to all institutions of higher, higher learning, and specifically UVU? go first on this one? Yes. Uh, gr great question. Uh, I think all of our universities uh, should be treated equally. Uh, I think uh, we need a plan for our education system, a long-range plan for how we're going to fund and deal with the growth in our education system. 30,000 new students here at uh, UVU. Obviously that increases, uh, has happened quickly, and we need to know how, as we continue to grow as a state, we're going to fund our education system. We have a 10-year transportation plan of how we're going to fund transportation, but we don't have one for education. Uh, Gary Herbert's been in office over a, over a year now, and we still haven't seen an education, education plan. I think we have to have that, and I, again, I think we need to make sure that all of our universities are treated equal. Uh, we need a long-range plan for our education system. How will the community college system fit in? How will the university system uh, fit in? Right now, we don't have one, and I think it's hurting all of us. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm not just talking about it, I'm actually doing it. Uh, bringing 25 different stakeholders representing different uh, diverse opinions on education together on a monthly basis that I chair is really doing something that's going to produ produce some significant results. When it comes to higher education, though, every state, every school is not the same. I know we like to think about that, but the mission statement that we have here at UVU is different than the mission statement we have at the University of Utah. It's a research institution at the University of Utah as a medical school. It, there's different assignments and different roles to play in a comprehensive approach here in the state of Utah. It's governed by the Board of Regents, which is the broad uh, uh, empire as far as what we should be doing with our higher education, the local Board of Trustees, and what they decide to do in their own confines here at, say, UVU or any other school, and then you've got to co uh, combine that with the legislature, which controls the purse strings. So it really is a combination of working together to decide what is the goal and aspirations that we have here in the state of Utah for higher education and our different higher, uh, uh, institutions of higher learning. And it's working actually pretty well. 
uh, all things considered. And uh, again, we're, we're, it's not going to ever be equal because we have different mission statements for the different schools. Okay, Mayor Karun, I'll give you a chance to address this in a, in a I, next. I, I, I agree that, uh, that we should be working with the Board of Regents, uh, with our, our educators, uh, with our, our students and citizens to come up with a long-range plan. It hasn't happened. I mean, it's great to bring people together, but at some point you have to have a plan and, and get something done. And I don't see that has happened to date. And I think we need to get that done and not wait, for, wait any longer because I think it's hurting our education system and our higher education system. Governor? Well, again, we are doing it. Uh, again, I'm not a ready, fire, aim kind of a guy. Uh, I think we need to, in fact, take some time and study the issues and bring the stakeholders together, the experts in the business, and see what their recommendations are, and then we'll come up with a plan. And I expect we'll have some recommendations rolling out in the next couple of weeks from this Education Commission. So I'm optimistic about that, and we'll see what happens. All right. Thank you very much for that question. Let's move now to a student from Westminster College, Cooper Henderson. Gentlemen, both of you have championed ethics reforms within state government during this campaign, and both of you have exchanged blows over the $13 million settlement paid out by UDOT recently. If taxpayers are paying millions in settlements to competitors who lose out on state contracts to avoid expensive litigation or delays, is it time that we prohibit political contributions from major state contractors? Or, more pointedly, what is more important? a business's right to free speech via political contributions or the protection of the taxpayer's money. Mayor Karun, you want to take that one on first? I think it's a combination of, of, uh, of both having free speech and, uh, and making sure that big money and uh, big politics isn't influencing our government leaders. Uh, in Salt Lake County, again, uh, we put in prohibitions of uh, st county contractors who are doing business with the county from giving contribution t to anybody running for a county office. I think we should do the same uh, at the state level. Uh, Gary Herbert does not support that, uh, and I think the system's uh, been corrupted because of it. And I think uh, companies who come to Utah now uh, feel that they somehow they have to uh, give uh, contributions in order to get contracts with the state. And that's wrong. It needs to be changed. The system stinks. And I, I think it's, it's about time we got something done. Governor? There's a number of uh, questions you ask in there that uh, probably are related and some not related. Uh, the idea of ethics reform is certainly something that I've championed. Uh, I introduced in my State of the State address at the legislature this past January the need for ethics reform. And the legislature responded. We had six bills that were passed on ethics reform and three different resolutions. Those issues had to do with uh, disclosure of conflicts of interest, uh, of disclosure of uh, camp, or excuse me, of, of uh, meals that were being given over ten dollars. Actually, having to name the legislature, we eliminated the ability to have uh, entertainment, jazz tickets, golf outings, those kinds of things. We've created uh, and will be voted on this November a legislative ethics commission to review ethics charges that take place. Um, so there's been a lot done on ethics. The issue that keeps coming up a little bit has to do with the campaign donation limits. Uh, again, that was asked Governor Romney yesterday when he was in town, and he said, you know, we see no evidence that campaign limitations has really worked in other parts of the, of the country. We still have the problem of money in the system. Look at the federal system, limits of $2,300, and yet does anybody believe that money is not a part of the, of the politics on a federal level? I'm ready to have that debate. I think we should have a debate. Mayor Caroon wants to have taxpayer-funded elections. I don't think that's the right way to go, and, and I think that's something we ought to have a good, healthy debate on sometime. Can I follow, follow up? Sure. You know, this is an important it's, issue. It's, and it's not about uh, jazz tickets or golf games. It's about $80,000 contributions uh, from contractors who are trying to get business from the state. Uh, it needs to be changed. Okay, well, Governor. Again, we can argue the, the, the money. There's no correlation between donations that have been given to my campaign or any contracts that have been vetted. And uh, to make that accusation is just false. But if we want to talk about the merits of having some kind of campaign donation limitation versus taxpayer-funded uh, uh, elections, I think that's a healthy discussion. I think it warrants discussion. There's pros and cons on both sides. And uh, we ought to have the discussion on that and make the, uh, you know, the accusations to a lot of good business people playing by the rules, Democrats and Republicans, uh, volunteers that have done nothing wrong to impugn their integrity is probably not the right road to go down. 
It is, uh, it, it is sort of a quandary because money is needed in a campaign. Mayor Caroon, news just came out that your campaign has raised $2 million, which, which is a, a lot of money. So the question to both of you is, if campaign donations are just honest infusions of cash from an interested party into your campaign, what's the purpose of it? What are you expecting that the donor wants from you? Isn't that a question that, that voters deserve to know the, the answer to? Let me start with Governor Herbert. Okay. Uh, again, I think it's a legitimate question, and that's why I think the answer to all this is transparency, immediate disclosure. I'm the first uh, uh, elected official to put my donations on our web page 48 hours over and above what the law requires. I think putting sunshine on it is, in fact, the answer to the issue. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's a practical aspect of, of campaign donation limitations, whether it's a free speech issue or the fact that we have people find ways to circumvent the law. Does it make a big difference whether one organization gives you a large check for $50,000 or if they go out and have, you know, 10 different organizations give you, f uh, members give you $5,000 donations? The largest special interest group we've got in this campaign is, is labor. And Mayor Karuna has got $159,000 from big labor. Uh, you know, again, we're a right to work state. You, you, that's something we're going to ask. Why is big labor contributing to my opponent's campaign in a right to work state? Those are the sunshine. That's the disclosure that the public then can vet and make a decision. I don't think it's wrong. I think transparency and openness is the answer to the question. Mayor Karuna. I think voters want good government. They want money out of politics. I think uh, big money and special interests do diminish the voters' ability to have a voice in our government, and that needs to change. I think I have 10 times more contributions uh, under $100 than my, th than my opponent. Uh, and when it comes to labor, uh, labor supports me because I s support a strong middle class. I su support uh, a, an educated workforce, a workforce that is trained, a workforce that is given a decent wage, and a work workforce that it gets decent benefits as well. All right, well, let me turn to a, an education funding question because this is another very crucial topic, top of the list, in fact, uh, in polls that are done on what, uh, what voters want, want to hear about. In your opinion, I guess this is a two-part question. Given the state of the education funding problem and issue, I should say, in the public system, is a tax increase inevitable? And if not, what gets to get cut? Governor? Well, no, a tax increase isn't inevitable. In fact, it would be the wrong thing to do, particularly as we grow out of this economic uh, downturn. Uh, the uh, flickering flame of economic recovery, which is happening in our state. Boy, I'm so tickled that we've got nearly 20,000 jobs that we've created is going to produce additional income tax, which will help to fund uh, uh, education. Uh, we could have $150 million of additional growth money this uh, coming legislative session to help with, with funding education. So that's the way you do it. You have a tax increase, and that flickering flame is certainly going to have a wet blanket of a tax increase and stymie the ability for us to, to uh, grow the economy. So a tax increase is not what you want to do. We've balanced the budget. We've proven the point by uh, balancing the budget and maintaining essential government services. Uh, again, education was facing a $400 million cut in their funding, and we stopped that from happening. We did the same thing in large part with higher education. That's why we've got accolades. That's why I've been endorsed by the UEA in the support of the college presidents and, and the commissioner of education because of what we did for higher education. So we don't want, need to have, in fact, it would be counterproductive to education to have a tax increase. Uh, uh, Mayor Crew. Uh, first of all, I'm also uh, uh, proud to be endorsed by the Utah Education Association. And I also don't believe we need a tax increase uh, to fund education. I think we need to restructure our, our state budget and make sure education is a priority. It doesn't mean raising taxes, but it means looking at uh, funding sources and making sure that education is a prior priority, again, in good times and in bad. I recently sat down with Governor Olean Walker. She had a, a concept which I thought was very interesting. Right now we take our income tax and put that towards operating uh, the education system and use our property tax primarily to fund buildings of new structures. 
Her concept was why not switch those around so we have a stable funding source as new students come into the system and then use the, the income tax for, uh, for building uh, construction as, uh, as money is, is, comes available. And I think we also need to look at uh, what I call some of our corporate welfare, uh, some of the incentives that are given out, and that money comes right out of our education system. And, th and I think it's critical that everybody make sure we have a good education system, where, whether it's a corporation or a family. All right, let's can, move on we, more. can we expand upon that? Because I think that's, a, and, and give the mayor, he talks about corporate welfare as if somehow there's a bag of money we're digging into and we're going to give this to some company to come and locate here in, in Utah. That is just not the way it works. Most of our incentives go to local businesses, by the way, but it's post performance. It means that if you grow additional tax money, we'll give you a tax credit and give you some of it back. Adobe's a good example. $150 million of new corporate income tax all going into education. We're going to give them 29% of that back if they produce. Taxpayers never at risk, but those incentive programs, whether they're three years, five years, 10 years, or 15 years, help fund education. That's a big difference between me and, and the mayor. It, the only difference is that uh, I, I believe in making sure they're uh, smaller, targeted, targeted incentives. Uh, those incentives do come out of our education system, whether it's beforehand or after, it still comes out of our education system. I don't think we should have 20-year incentive uh, packages. Our industries change so quickly, like technology. We're giving uh, incentives 20 years down the road uh, when uh, we don't know what that industry will even look like in five, 10 years. More student questions now. Tucker Smith from Snow College. On behalf of the students at Snow College, where enrollment is steadily on the rise and funding is steadily decreasing, what will you do to ensure that the quality of education is not compromised for these students? Governor? Well, you're doing a great job down there, Ephraim. It's a wonderful uh, college and uh, growing in demand because of the wonderful setting and the good education that you're providing down there. Um, again, it goes back to funding. How are you going to come up with the money? Uh, you know, everything we talk about uh, it grow, goes back to the economy. That's why I'm focused laser-like on growing the economy. Uh, this money that comes in, that the mayor's talking about, is all new money. It doesn't matter whether it's new money comes in in three years, five years, or 10 years, or 15 or 20 years, it's new money. That money goes into education. And, it, it, we, and we give nothing back if you don't produce it. So there's nothing to give if you don't produce it. So it's all new additional money to help fund for education. If we grow the economy, that's the rising tide that raises all boats on the ocean. And uh, if whatever your pet issue is, education, transportation, health and human services, we've got to get the economy going, number one, to fund our other needs. Uh, funding obviously is, is important. Uh, technology can also be used to help improve education uh, in, in any uh, city around the state. I think we also need to involve our community in, in the solution, uh, businesses especially. Businesses are the ones who are hiring uh, the people out of our, our colleges and our, our universities as well. Let's get them involved to figure out what programs work best for the business community so the students coming out of college are prepared for the jobs of the, of the 21st century. I recently went to a debate uh, uh, together with, with Gary Herbert, and uh, the moderator asked the students in the room how many of them thought they would have to leave the state uh, to get uh, a, good, a good job after they finished their education. And almost half, I think over half the students raised their hands, and that's something that we shouldn't accept. We should make sure that every student has the ability to get a good job after graduating from one of our uh, colleges or one of our universities or one of our technical schools. Well, since we've got an audience of students, let's get a show of hands here. How many of you students here feel you may have to leave the state in order to get a good job after you graduate? Well, duly noted, you have the candidates for governor. There's an interesting question. I'd like to see this. What state do you think you're going to go to to find the job? I'm curious to know where you think you need to go in light of the fact that Utah has the lowest unemployment rate of any state from Colorado West other than Wyoming. So I'm, I'm curious to know, because I, I, again, that's probably good feedback to say, well, I'm going to go to California, I'm going to go to Nevada, unemployment rate at 14%. Where? Sure. My wife works for Adobe. We're not going anywhere. Hey. All right. All well, right. there's some people. Glad to have okay, Adobe here. A thousand new jobs coming to well, Utah. You, perhaps we can address this uh, on an individual basis and we'll move this along so that we can hear from another student. David Smith, who is a student regent, has a question. 
Thank you, gentlemen, both for being here. I think there's an emerging theme as it pertains to funding for our schools. Uh, the last couple of years have been difficult on our state's campuses because of the reduction in tax revenues. Each school faces different types of challenges because of this. For example, schools like Dixie State and Utah Valley University are facing record enrollment growths and are literally starting to burst at the seams. Others like Southern Utah University and Snow College are dealing with very outdated and in some cases unsafe buildings. Still others have infrastructure issues. Um, what would you do as governor to address the individual needs of these campuses? Mayor Caroon? One of the things, again, I go back to is, is creating a plan for our entire education system. I, I don't think every university or every college can be everything to, to everybody. While we need to, uh, uh, to make sure they're, they're uh, well funded and, and treated the same, I think we, we can't have an engineering school at every university. We can't have a medical school at every university. Uh, we need to have uh, a plan where we can have certain universities specialize in certain things and certain universities can specialize in other things. I think that's one way we can help make sure that uh, we're funding our, our universities properly and not trying to, to spread a little bit everywhere but concentrating the money on, on certain uh, universities to, to do certain things. I think that uh, really would help make a difference. One of the things we saw at our legislature this year, uh, they mandated that uh, Weber State uh, get a new engineering program. Uh, is that right or wrong? Uh, I won't comment uh, regarding that individually, but I think that just goes to show that uh, we can't uh, have our legislature deciding which universities are going to be what. We need to work with the Board of Regents, uh, work with our, our communities, business community, and others to make sure we have a good, uh, solid education plan for the state. Well, we've asked the question many different ways, uh, and it has to do with funding. Again, the source of funding is grow the economy. But the management of those funds comes with the Board of Trustees at the localist level. I'm a local government guy. I believe in a bottom-up approach to things. What they did here at UVU under uh, President Bill Cedarberg was manage their resources and find what the niches were they needed to meet in the marketplace and manage their monies accordingly. Uh, I don't want us to micromanage from the top down. It ought to be from the bottom up at the localist level. One of the things we need to keep in mind is we can only uh, afford what we can afford. Uh, to say, well, it's a nice to have or a need to have is something we need to dif differentiate. And in Utah, we're very good at managing the taxpayers' money. We're one of only eight states that have a AAA bond rating. Now, that's significant because that means when we go to borrow money, like for the new science center here at UVU, we're able to get a lower rate and save the taxpayers' dollars. We are, in fact, are putting money into brick-and-mortar structures in, in Dixie, Utah State, here at UVU, and others because we've got a good bond rating that allows us to borrow money to build the infrastructure you need to have to expand the growth opportunities. All right, thank you, I, can I just f follow up on the AAA bond rating? Uh, this year, the state of Utah is actually using Salt Lake County to bond for some of its ro road projects uh, because they're, they're getting uh, close to their uh, bonding limits or, or worried about their, their bonding limits. So uh, we also have a AAA bond rating from all three rating agencies. We're only uh, 30, uh, one of 30 out of over 3,000 counties that have that. Uh, and we're seeing this, the state having some issues this year. And again, I go back to the 12th worst budget gap in the nation uh, of any state uh, where, uh, where a lot of one-time money and uh, federal money was used to balance the budget. Uh, there are issues that need to be faced at our, at our state uh, level, and they haven't been faced yet. Governor, have they been faced? Salt Lake County invited us to participate on that bond, uh, and we accept the invitation. We were just recognized by Steve Forbes and Forbes Magazine as the fiscally fittest state in America. I just came from Wall Street where we got a triple-A bond rating from uh, Standard & Poor's, Fitch's, and Moody's. A triple-triple. They look at our overall package of government services and said, you're one of the best of the best. Uh, again, uh, do we have challenges out there? Of course we do. But we have a rainy day fund we put in place here years ago. We still have money in the rainy day fund to take care of any structural imbalances we have, which is right now only about $319 million. So if you look at our fiscal responsibility, Utah's doing it right, and we're a leader in the country, and other people outside our borders, not running for governor, actually recognize that. All right. Thank you, Governor. Let's go to a student from Weber State, Victoria Thompson. I am short. Um, it appears likely that immigration reform legislation will be introduced in the state legislature this year. What is your position on immigration reform? 
generally, and what is your perspective on the potential of marginalizing the accessibility to our schools for minorities and immigrant minorities? Governor? Well, the immigration issue is one that's fraught with a lot of emotion and is born out of frustration because the federal government has really been AWOL on addressing the issue. Uh, Congress is good at doing two things. One is nothing, and the other one is overreact. Uh, we end up having a problem that's a reoccurring issue. It's gone for years and years and years. The federal government has not addressed it. And it's bubbled up with what you've seen in Arizona, a border state that's saying, hey, we cannot put up with this uh, drug trafficking, human trafficking on our borders, which is increasing the crime rate in, in Arizona. I understand the frustration that Mayor or Governor uh, Brewer has in, in, in Arizona. We're trying to bring people together. I've given six guiding principles to our legislature and others that want to have it engage in this debate as I've brought people together and say we cannot just wink and nod at the rule of law. But we also need to remember the humanity of the people we're dealing with. The federal government has a role. Business has a role. We need to give resources if we decide to have local enforcement. Those six guiding principles you can find on the web page are what need to guide us as we address this very emotional debate. It, the Im immigration issue is, is a very uh, heated debate right now, and I think our federal government has let us down. Uh, but I also think that if we have 50 different states with 50 different solutions, uh, we'll probably create a, a bigger mess. Uh, I believe we should tighten our borders. I think we should punish companies who are knowingly hiring and taking advantage of undocumented workers. I think we should go after the, the crime association, uh, associated with illegal immigration. Uh, at the same time, I think we need a system that works, a system that allows people who want to come to this country uh, to, to, to work and be productive citizens and, and feed their families. I think we need to have a system that works for those people. Um, I think uh, there's some issues where Gary Herbert has, has not followed up on what he said. Uh, the E-Verify bill is one of them, uh, where he promised to call a special session uh, for companies who, who, uh, who are hiring people that are supposed to verify their employment. Gary Herbert said he was going to call a special session, didn't, so we now have, have no uh, enforcement measure for that. I also believe we, don't, uh, we shouldn't change the Constitution uh, in, in the United States. Uh, to prevent people who were born in this country uh, from being citizens of the United States. We need to fix our immigration uh, problem, not change our Constitution. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, move along. The governor can, uh, if he chooses to take that uh, on a, by way of response, at, at, uh, perhaps in, clothing, in closing. Uh, from Dixie State College, Abby Hershey. Good afternoon. In recent legislative sessions, we've heard rumors that there might be a proposed bill to do away with the Utah Board of Regents. Would you support such an action? Governor? Absolutely not. Uh, I think the Board of Regents has a very significant role to play. We've modified it so we have a little more regional, broad-based representation so that the geographic areas of uh, Utah are being represented and feel like they're getting good representation. I think that was a, a good move. Uh, but the Board of Regents really are the experts to get together on a regular basis, some of the best and brightest people we have in our state. And uh, to do away with them, I think, would be very short-sighted and uh, headed in the wrong direction. Mayor Carew? I think we agree on that issue. I agree. All right. Well, then let's take some of the time that we've lost and move on to Chase Jardine from the University of Utah for our final student question. All right. A lot has been spoken about tuition and funding, but what are your plans for need-based financial aid? Mayor Karun? Uh, need-based need financial aid obviously is important for those students who can't, uh, uh, who can't you know, fill the, uh, the needs of, of the rising tuition that we've seen. So I go back to uh, capping our tuition as one possible solution so students can plan in advance. And then I think we need to uh, do our best to make sure that our, our students are able to uh, get the, the financial uh, need from the state when they can't get it from other, other grants or other areas. Uh, it's critical, again, that our students have, uh, have the ability to go to, to go to college. I met two young women up in uh, Logan not too long ago. They had lost their, uh, their uh, grants from the state because of budget cuts, and they didn't know what their future was going to look like. They lost a year of their education. Uh, and we can't afford to do that with our other s students out there. We need to make sure that we have the funding available for them uh, to get the education uh, to fill the jobs of the 21st century. Governor? Well, I go back to what I said before. Uh, this is an issue that ought to be addressed at the local level with the Board of uh, Trustees as they manage their resources and working with the Board of Regents. 
uh, we at this college, uh, university, had a significant outreach for uh, raising money to create scholarship money. The private sector needs to step up and help out. Those who have gone through the system, have had some successes, can, can give money back and, and help create scholarships. The idea of capping, I just, uh, I, I think that's a bad idea. If you cap revenues but you can't cap expenses, you end up having a problem. It's just bad economics. It reminds me of Richard Nixon days when we had price and wage controls. It was bad for the economy. Capping uh, what we charge for tuitions and not being able to cap the expense side just won't work. So again, we need to empower the private sector. We need to grow the economy. Let the board of trustees manage the resources the best they can. They know better how to get the best, best bang for the buck. And I think we'll go through a difficult time and find some success. All right, thank you very much for the questions and for your responses. And the time has come now for us to move to our closing statements. A lot of you probably saw us doing the coin toss at the, at the front. Governor Herbert won the coin toss, which means that he goes second. So our final closing statement comes from Mayor Peter Caroon. Two minutes. There's a, a clear difference, as you could tell, from this debate between the two candidates. And the citizens and the students here today have a clear choice. I believe in a, a strong education system. I believe in a stable funding system. That's why I chose Cheryl Allen, a Republican, as my lieutenant governor, because she's uh, spent her whole life in the education system. Uh, we have the UEA endorsement. I'm proud of that. And we have a plan for our education system. It's online. Uh, Gary Herbert doesn't have a plan. He cut the budget uh, this year and did not fund the 24,000 new students we have coming into the education system. I'm a fiscal conservative. I run an efficient, effective government. I believe in all of our businesses, big and small. I also believe in campaign finance reform because I think it's important to get big money out of politics. I believe in strong, decisive leadership as well. And this race is not uh, about uh, who's been endorsed by, by whom. This race is about the citizens of Utah. It's about those people who are out there on a day-to-day -day basis trying to make ends meet and trying to feed their families. I want to be uh, the person representing the citizens of Utah. I want to represent those who are out every day uh, sweating and toiling. That's, what, that's who I am, and I want to be your governor. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Rich, and thanks to the student body officers and for all of you for being here. I think it really is important, particularly for the young people to get involved. <clears throat> As I mentioned, uh, you know, it's important. You are the rising generation, and you're going to take it all over after we're uh, gone. And the question is, are you going to be ready? Are you ready to take whatever we give you, good, bad, or ugly, and, and move it to the next level? I believe you are, and I believe you will be. But getting engaged, getting involved is the first step. So thank you for being here today. Uh, you know, I'm very optimistic about Utah's future. I'm not negative at all about uh, what we're doing and how we're doing it. I think we are on the right road. I think we're going in the right direction. Are we where we want to be? Of course not. There are challenges out there, but we also have opportunities to, in fact, embrace those challenges and find better ways of doing things. By every measurable standard outside of our borders, people look at Utah as the gold standard, the emerging standard for how government should be done at a state level for the communities that we have. We're listed number one as the best quality of life in all of America. We're listed in the top two or three uh, as the best places for business. We're ranked as one of the best many states in America. We're doing something right, and the results are that the economy is growing. Again, 20,000 new jobs here in, in, in the state of Utah and growing about 1,500 more per month. We're leading the nation out of this economic doldrums and showing them how it can be done by principles that we've embraced here in Utah, uh, which is lower taxes, uh, limited government, make sure it's effective, individual responsibility, and empowerment of the private sector. We have the same goals and aspirations, we just have different ways to get there. Mine is more of a conservative approach, his is more a left of center approach. So again, I believe that the, the, uh, the choice for governor is clear, that the best choice for governor in this election is the governor. Thank you. All right. Now would be an appropriate time for us to applaud our candidates. Thank you very much.